Hello and welcome to this Somerville Media Center live production for May 14th with the state delegation update. Joining me today, I am Joe Lynch, by the way, and joining me today is State Senator Patricia Jalen and State Representative Christine Barber. Senator Jalen, how are you today? I am so happy because it's beautiful outside, but I'm inside now talking to you. All right. Well, I promise you I'll have you out of here in 28 minutes. How's that? I, the good thing is that these days we can work from our, our back porch. We can answer emails. We can make phone calls. We can have video conferences all day long, but I decided it would be better. I'm going to give you a little guidance as a novice uh, of the Somerville Media Center. Be very careful when you go outside. There's a lot of ambient noise that's going to creep into your phone conversations and your video chats. Christine Barber, how are you? I'm doing fine. Also glad the sun's out. Um, although, unfortunately, my internet doesn't work outside my, my house, so uh, cannot sit on the porch, but doing fine. Thanks. Um, hope, hope everyone in your world is, is well and doing okay as well. We are doing well, thankfully. Um, all employees of the Media Center are up and operating at full capacity and even more so. Um, I'm sure I don't have to tell you. We kind of wish for the days when we could take a, an hour break, but uh, knowing what you, both of your jobs are, um, thanks for joining us once again. Senator Jalen, I wanted to start with you. Um, more disturbing um, numbers, over 5,300 deaths in the Commonwealth of, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And what's even more concerning, and I know you want to talk about this because of your position, is that in Massachusetts, almost 60% of those 5,300 deaths are coming out of some type of a long-term care facility. So let's, let's jump into it with the facts that we know. We know that people with underlying health conditions are more susceptible to have more severe consequences if they contract COVID. We also know that people older and the average age of those deaths here in Massachusetts is 82. Um, older folk who are confined to congregate housing with underlying medical conditions are really taking the brunt of this. So from your standpoint with elder affairs at the State House, do you want to chat a little bit more about that and then we can move into other aspects of today's show? Well, there's, I would say that the administration took too long to begin to take some steps to help people in nursing homes. Um, but the steps that they took were really good. And so one of my goals is to follow up on that and continue to look at how nursing homes can be safe going forward. So in particular, I would single out the need to have a stable and well-paid workforce so that there's there, they were understaffed to start with. By the third week of the pandemic, they were understaffed by 40%. And that has bad consequences for the people living there because the people that worked there got sick or they had to take care of somebody that was sick and they came in sick with um, asymptomatic and they gave it to people there. We need to have a stable, good paid workforce and we need to reconfigure nursing homes and think about maybe having single rooms, maybe having, we need to really think about whether nursing homes are a good plan. But I have to say, Massachusetts, I think, has the highest rate of nursing home deaths in the country. So this is serious, and we're going to work on it pretty hard before the budget comes out. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Senator Jalen, you know, I'm glad that you can kind of keep up on top of um, the elder affairs things that are happening because, um, you know, jokingly, I say I am a person of a certain age um, and I don't plan on leaving anytime soon. Um, uh, since both parents did not pass from this world until they were both in their late 90s, um, unfortunately for anyone who knows me, you got me another 35 years. So, um, but when we talk about the susceptibility of the older population or the population that has some underlying health concerns, that really should be our focus moving forward in terms of who gets um, 
I, I, I'm very careful when I say this and how we prioritize our efforts, because as you said at the beginning of this, we did not prioritize those types of living arrangements early on. And we, and should, have known, we should have known from Washington, where the first big outbreak was Kirkland Life Center, and we should have known. We did, some people knew. So what have we got going forward in terms of um, what you're hearing at, on Beacon Hill for the protection of seniors, congregate housing, long-term oh, care gosh. facilities? I think, I think workforce is a main thing. I think funding, how that the funding has to, the good thing about what the administration did, in my opinion, is that they gave a lot more money to nursing facilities, but they also had some strings attached that they're gonna be monitored for infection control, for staffing levels. They cannot spend the money on profits they ex they can't ex and on uh, real estate deals. It has to go to staff and infection control and PPE. So very restricted ways though that funding is gonna be used. Yep, yep. And um, it's pretty sta stabilized. The industry was already destabilized it will destabilize more because the number of people in it is going down and the number of people willing to go to a nursing home is going to go down. Correct, correct. Um, before we get into another part of the health issue as a result of COVID, because I wanted to talk a little bit about the post-traumatic or the traumatic consequences when it comes to mental health. And this isn't just for our seniors or our kids, it's for everyone who is feeling the effect of this. But before we get to that, I wanna um, cut over to Rep Barber, Christine Barber. Christine, you've been working on a number of initiatives um, since the last time you were on. Um, why don't you take it away with any updates or new initiatives that you've got? Sure, thanks, uh, thanks Joe. And I think um, one of the pieces that I've been working on and partnering with Senator Jalen and other legislators is looking at incarcerated people. So very similar to people in nursing homes, um, people who are incarcerated, there is no way to social distance in a prison or a jail. Um, and even though you know not all are elderly, a much higher percentage have underlying um, health effects and um, serious issues that, that make them much more susceptible to COVID. Um, it's another place I would say that we didn't, I would say the administration did not um, take enough actions early. And we saw um, some early break um, outbreaks um, at Bridgewater. But from there, um, I look really closely at Framingham, which is the only prison for women in the state. And I was just looking at the infection rates um, and they're, they're pretty stunning. Um, of 100, there's only 188 women there and 38% of the population is positive for COVID. Um, and that is an institution that uh, we, we talk to them a lot. It is challenging to, um, to do social distancing there. So there continue to be problems. Um, but something that we're working on, there is a bill at the state level to decarcerate and to try to move people who are um, up for medical parole. And these are folks who are usually um, elderly and have a lot of underlying medical conditions and really pose no threat to society, but they need a, a plan of a place to go. Um, we're trying to move more of those, those folks out. It's really challenging because where are they? Uh, some of them have homes to go to. Uh, nursing homes are also, you know, not the best place for them now. So it's, it's, it's even more challenging to work That's with them. Yeah. So, um, but some have been doing okay. So the Middlesex County Jail run by Sheriff Peter Katusian, which is our county, um, they have reduced their population by 25%. Now that, of course, is after a court case, the SJC, the Supreme Judicial Court, ruled um, that they had to release people who were um, being held pre-trial where, where that was appropriate. And the county is doing a, a pretty good job of, of trying to get people out back into the community. Um, so these are really folks who have not been sentenced yet and um, you know, 
arguably jail is not the place that they should be, um, but it's definitely not a safe place for people right now. So we're trying to take, um, to push as much as we can to make sure there's PPE and all the protections for incarcerated people as well. And, and my understanding from listening to talk radio last week is this issue caused a little bit of a dust up between the Suffolk County Sheriff and the Bristol County Sheriff. I don't want to get into it here, but obviously politics and their politics is playing into some of the decisions that are being made. Um, we're seeing that play out all over the country. It's not just localized here in Massachusetts, but on the incarceration, I wanted to ask the inverse of a, a, a question that was asked of me during one of the shows last week. Have we seen the court system completely fall apart when it comes to court cases and a delay in jailing people or incarcerating people? So for instance, somebody who committed uh, a, a, an offense back in early February and had a court date for some time in March, and that got delayed. How are the court systems keeping up with the criminal justice part of this? It's a good question, and I'm not an expert in this area, but I do know, I mean, while the courts are, are obviously closed for entry, there are, they're happening online, that there are cases still happening online, um, but it, it is a place where we need to rethink, especially incarcerating people. We have to, you know, um, be incarcerating as few people as possible since it's such a dangerous place for people right now. Looking at dangerousness and other issues, but really taking care that we're not using that as a system for people who can't afford a small bail like we've done in the past. Okay. All right. I, I do, unless either one of you have a little bit more on your highly specialized piece, I want to talk about, and I want to try to shift this a little bit to re-entry programs. I mean, obviously there are enormous amount of needs that you're both working on current day, um, but I know both of you well enough to know that that doesn't preclude um, your individual efforts of planning for the future and thinking about once the governor becomes comfortable with a re-entry plan, that filters down to your individual districts, and then it filters down, my apologies, it, it will filter down into um, uh, municipality level, your district level. So one of the things that has come forward is with this re-entry plan that the governor has issued a four-point plan for, will be the details on how to do this safely. The question, speaking, I, I'm sorry, speaking of the prison system, that was former Alderman Dennis Sullivan, getting back to me with the question that I was asked you to, so. Um, wow. But the question comes in is, we've got a re-entry sense of when people want uh, to go back to work. With that comes the fact that the parents of school-aged children want their kids to go back to school. Mm -hmm. The one certainty that we have, and I'm gonna repeat this, anybody who's watching these shows, the one certainty we have today on May 14th is the uncertainty of all of that. So let's, let's take it from the standpoint of Department of Education. What is the Department of Education saying to the Senate and to the House of Reps when it comes to their plan for potentially reopening. Do we have any kind of update at all today? So there was an oversight hearing yesterday that the House and Senate held um, and the Secretary of Education and a number of others came forward to testify. Um, I didn't, I mean, there were not, there are definitely not specifics for how they're planning to move forward. There are so many questions um, and, and you're exactly right, that without an education system, and especially for early education and care, without those systems up and running, um, it seems impossible for parents to be able to go back to work and, and even think about transitioning. It's one of the many challenges that we have. Um, there's a lot of concern about the many inequities um, that, that kids are facing. Um, the amount of kids who don't have internet access across the state is much higher than I think um, people thought. The amount of, the number of 
of children who are sharing computers. Um, if they have a computer, they're, off, they're often sharing it with other family members or other, other children. Um, there are huge needs in access right now uh, if we're going to continue doing this at home. And there's a lot of questions to our, our budget at the state level. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. Senator Jalen, on the Senate side, what have we got from uh, our colleagues there? I, I think that it, the uncertainty is completely, I mean, just think about if business is open on May 18th and daycare is closed until the beginning of July, what are, what are parents supposed to do? Are they supposed to go to work and leave their kids somewhere? Where? Um, and the same with even school age kids. There's kids you don't, young kids you don't necessarily want to leave at home while you're at work. I think that's going to be, there's no one on the governor's reopening committee that represents early education or education or workers. So Let, Let's talk about that for one second if we can. I mean, a major sector of the workforce or our educators, or medical providers, and care providers, meaning, you know, not necessarily doctors, but home health care workers mm -hmm. and preschool care workers. What is their sense of how they're going to get out from underneath this? I guess my question is, what comes first? You know, do you take care of all of that first and then open business so that parents aren't worried about their kids? I mean, how, how do you... No, that's not going to happen because they are going to open things. They're already opening golf courses. So what's next? Uh, yeah. Well, I, you're not going to catch me saying anything about whether recreational places should open before people's livelihoods. But I guess there is a sector of the population who work in that industry and are also concerned about it. But my, my sense right now, May 14th, is that there is no one industry that has a rock solid, fail safe safety plan for the re entry of their employees into a physical plant environment. This, I haven't seen it. And I've been looking at these plans coming from other sectors saying, can I apply that to the Somerville Media Center to reopen to the public? And there's so many holes in that that I, I wouldn't feel safe. So, if you will allow me one thing, I have to make a correction from yesterday's show. I misspoke when I said that the Somerville Media Center would be closed to the public through the end of August. I'm going to make the correction. We're going to do it via email. We are going to be, and we'll announce it probably tomorrow or Monday, we will be closed until the end of July. I misspoke saying it was the end of August. Um, so to the parents of the school camps and to Heather McCormick, my apologies, but we'll get it out there. There's some other issues that we have to deal with. So I'm just thinking about the media center compared to an early uh, child care center. There's a limited number of people and they are not people who need uh, someone to help them go to the bathroom, for example. Uh, in a child care center, you might have a whole bunch of kids sharing a bathroom, sharing the, um, sharing toys, um, wanting to touch each other, not having learned a lot of self-control, which many of us still, you know, struggle with. But um, I think that's going to be really challenging. On the other hand, maybe those are people. I don't know. I, I think. Uh I don't either, no. Senator Jalen. No. Yeah, I don't either. That's why we are being very, very cautious about any kind of reopening. Um, if I don't have guidance from above, then I'm shooting in the dark. I'm trying to fight a fire blindfolded. So, uh, Rep. Barber. And I was just going to uh, piggyback on that, that I think it's a huge problem that we didn't have laborers, workers on the governor's reopening task force, especially those who are out there every day now, because we know one of the critical pieces we need is a safe workplace, is PPE, contract, contact 
testing, you know, testing for all of us, things that we don't yet have. And we don't have them already in the sectors, the grocery store employees, the home health aides, the people who are working in nursing homes. It's been a real struggle to get those basic things in place now. And they're the, they're the essential workers who are really bearing the brunt of this um, and don't have the, the luxury and privilege of, of staying home. So to not take into account that voice, I think is a real problem, but I know a lot of labor groups have weighed in with the task force and I'm hopeful we'll be will be heard a little more than they have been because they have the, the expertise and they have the knowledge about what we need to do here. So there's a lot more work to do. There's and another, I, I'm sorry, Senator Jalen. Well, I, I just, I'm gonna put it out from a different side, which is listening to small business people who say, well, my little store can't be open, but people can go buy the same things at Target. So there, there's real inequities there also. I don't, I'm not saying that all little stores should be open, they, but they might be safer. It, it might be safer to go to a toy store than to go to Target. Senator Jalen, you will appreciate the humor in this. Somebody sent it to me this morning saying that um, 2020 is the year of uh, purchasing marijuana is legal, but haircuts are not, and the hippies have won. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of liked it. I kind of liked it. Um, let's move into the mental health issues. There are going to be enormous mental health issues as a consequence of what we're all going through. That's one of the questions that I presented to Dr. Curley from the Somerville School District yesterday. How is our school district prepared, or are we, to deal with the fallout from this when if, if those kids go back to school in September? What have we got from a mental health um, initiative on Beacon Hill? Are there any bills that are being filed for additional funding to assist not only the individual, but the school system itself? I, I mean, my sense is it's not someplace that we've gotten yet. I mean, the budget itself, if for anything that needs funding, um, the budget itself is something that we're wrestling with all the time right now. Um, there is, the estimates I've heard recently is for the upcoming fiscal year, it's likely a $6 billion hole out of a, a $42 billion budget, but almost half of that is mass is healthcare costs. So it's it's not really 42 billion. Um, so 6 billion out of out of that is is lost because of the lost revenue and sales and um, other taxes. Um, so we have a lot to do to fund fund education. And it's a huge priority, obviously, of the legislature and of our local communities. So we're going to do that. But there is there is a lot of need. And I think we need to um, think really carefully about that. I mean, I, the mental and behavioral health system before all of this um, has huge problems. A lot of, I've worked with you know, the Children's Mental Health Campaign, a lot of advocates who've worked on this for years, the way that behavioral health providers are paid, um, that we still don't have mental health, true mental health parity in the state. Um, they're not paid at the same level. It's hard for them to get approved as providers. Uh, there's so many challenges. So we already have a really um, Swiss cheese kind of system. And it's going to take a lot, I think, to get to a different place that you're right, we all will need some level of, of, um, of treatment, but especially young people, especially frontline workers, people really affected by by death and all of the challenges that have happened. Well, I didn't plan it this way. But while we're sitting here recording this show, uh, Mary Cassesso, I know you both know her, she just replied to me looking for a mental health professional to come on a show next week and talk about the warning signs that people should be looking for. Because I don't think any of us are, are immune to the COVID-19 virus and none of us are gonna be immune to the effects of the things that we're going through today. So um, thank you, Mary, for <laughs> responding very quickly. But I wanna say something else about mental health that a lot of it is not just about treatment, but about having a, a predictable life, um, a social life. So pe young people, all people, 
need to have social connections and they need to be with other people. So reopening schools, for example, is going to really help kids cope. If they're with other trusted adults, uh, if they're with other kids, that's gonna really help them a lot. So these are balancing acts. And if we wait until it's totally physically safe, there will be other problems arise. So I think you're helping me think about that too, that I think being isolated is very bad for us. Most of us don't what do well in isolation. Yeah, we are by nature the social beings. We, we tend to travel in groups. We communicate in groups. And, you know, as much as I love being able to do, you know, multiple things at the same time, sitting in my pajamas, I, I'm, I'm missing, you know, that face-to-face -face without a mask. I'm missing that connection because what they say is true. You see into the soul through the eyes. Um, and a lot of times you kind of miss the eyes when you're doing these Zoom things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quiet for a minute. We have about uh, two minutes left. I'm going to turn it back over to both of you if there are things that you want to bring to the forefront that we haven't covered already. We did get one um, request from one of the readers of my newsletter who said, what can people do? How can we be active and effective? And she was asking about how to affect um, legislation, for example, but also how to get help for themselves or other people. Um, so I just want to point out to people, don't write us letters because no one knows where our physical letters go to the state house. But, and don't call us. Write emails because, well, you can call us, but we pick up our phones remotely. One of our, my staff has to pick up messages. We don't get phone calls at the office now. They are all sent through. So that's one little piece of advice, but we do appreciate hearing from people. The way I know what to work on in the labor committee is the complaints I get about, even though they staffed up, how hard it is for some people to get um, PUA particularly. Um, I agree. I So one of the challenges right now for us is, you know, I do lots of calls to lots of leaders in the community. I have volunteers and talked about calling seniors and checking in, but it's hard without, we're not out at community events and we're not able to, you know, door knock and do other things that we normally would to keep a pulse on people. So email us, call us, reach out, um, don't be shy about it because that's how we hear what's going on, what the problems are, what good ideas are out there and we'll share them and, and we really appreciate that. So it helps us out as well. Beautiful, I wanna put one more plug in there. Um, the mayor of Somerville, Joe Cardatoni, had his senior town hall meeting this week. The Council on Aging here has a card and note writing campaign mm -hmm. that is now in effect through the Council on Aging. For more details on that, where you write the note card, you send it back in, or you drop it off at Council on Aging, and they take care of addressing and mailing. So I think it's a beautiful way. It's a more traditional way of keeping touch with our seniors. I love still getting physical birthday cards. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until November to get mine. I want to thank Senator Jalen, Representative Barber. Until next time, stay safe and stay informed.